All right, so as I was working on this presentation last night, I decided to change it a little bit, actually. And I decided to change it because of a guy right there, Victor. So what I wanted to talk about was the whole backstory of getting to Morpheus and where it is now, and the, all the work went into it, and all the lessons I learned on, along the way. But what I basically realized is that Morpheus is the end result of an idea I had roughly 20 years ago. And really, as coaches, if our goal is to be entrepreneurs and build coaching businesses, beyond just training people, what it comes down to is one thing, and that's building a product that can scale, that can work for you. And that starts with just this process of coming up with an idea and turning it into an actual product that you can sell and deliver to the people and make an impact. And so last night I was at dinner, I was talking to Victor, and what were you telling me you were working on, Victor, just to share the, with the group? So Victor's stories are like a lot of people. I've, people reach out to me all the time online. They have an idea for something. They want to build a course. They want to do some training program. They want to launch something. So how many of you, just in general, over the last few years, have had some idea that you thought, if I could do this, if I could bring this to life, it could really work. It could be successful for me. Okay, Almost everybody, right? You had to have that idea at some point, or you wouldn't have created a gym, or you wouldn't have created a training program. You wouldn't have created the businesses that you all have and the reason that you're all here. So all of us go down this path of at some point coming up with an idea that we think we can make successful and we think we can turn into something. And then we come to events like this to try to make our products better. And ultimately, at the end of the day, whether you're a coach, you're a gym owner, you're selling online courses, programs, it doesn't matter. It all starts as an idea. And so what I want to talk about is how do we take an idea, something that started in our head, and then how do we turn it into something that we deliver to people at the end and hopefully have a big impact on their lives and our own as well, because that's why we're doing it. So I just, as I wrote that, zero to launch on the way here, I realized I, I stole that from somebody else, so don't post that. But the, the, the idea is basically, Ramit Sethi, actually, I'll give him some credit. It's a really good course. So the idea is basically thinking through this idea of how do we take the, our ideas and not just talk about doing them and not just think about what could have happened if we'd gone down this road and tried it, but actually do it, give it a shot. So I'm going to talk about that process. I'm going to talk about my own journey, because again, Morpheus has really built an idea that happened 20 years ago, and this is the evolution of that idea. And I'm actually going to pick on Victor a little bit and have him contribute, because I want to talk about his journey and how he's thinking about it, and I'll give him my feedback. So I was helping, trying to help him last night of how I would look at what he's trying to do. And I've had many people over the years, again, in your same seat, say, hey, I want to try this. And they want to know how to be successful with it. So I'm going to give you my thoughts. And really. I'm going to give you the back end behind the scenes to really what's a $2 million product at this point, which I still can't believe uh, in Morpheus. So 2003, I opened my gym. And about two years before that, I'd been introduced to heart rate variability. And it's a crazy story, because if you haven't heard it, there was a guy named Randy Huntington, and he was a track coach. He coached Mike Powell. He was USA track and field. Like, this guy was a legend, but almost nobody knew about him. He was from this area, and one day I was like, hey, Randy, what? What tools, what things can I do to make myself a better coach? I was like 20 years old. It was just kind of a random question. He's like, you need to get this thing called the Omega Wave. Call this guy. And he just like hands me a number and says, call this guy Val. And so I said, all right, no problem. This is again before I had a gym. I just graduated college. So I call this guy up, and he's this very thick Russian accent. And he's like, meet me at the airport hotel. And then literally it's like 10 minutes from here. And I'm like, OK. So I go down to the airport hotel. This big Russian dude shows up in a trench coat, like no joke. Tells me to lay down on the couch and take my shirt off. And I'm just like, OK. I'm just kind of going along with it. Randy says to do it. So he pulls out this briefcase. And he like has this laptop. And he has all these electrodes and wires coming off it. I'm just like, what the hell is this guy doing? He starts hooking all these electrodes up to me. He asks me my height, my weight, starts punching shit into his keyboard. And next thing I know, I see all these graphs and things going on the computer screen for like two or three minutes, and then he starts telling me about my fitness level, my recovery, my heart rate zones. Like He just starts telling me all these things that made no sense. Like How would he possibly know anything about my fitness level or about my recovery, the workouts? So he's like, you do a lot of heavy lifting. You suck at aerobic work. And I'm, he got that right. So it was just this big eye-opening moment where I was like, holy shit, Like this can unlock the black box of training. Because like I talked about before, a lot of training is guesswork. We write down sets, we write down exercises, and we hope that it works. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. And those answers, why, aren't always clear. 
So he starts explaining to me that the Russians developed this technology for the space program, and then they were working on it for the athletes in the 1980s, and then the Soviet Union collapsed, and the whole thing fell apart. He goes through this like, whole journey of like, how they got there. And at the end, I'm like, I'm sold. Like, this is the best sales pitch I've ever heard in my life. Like, I have to have this thing as a coach. This is the future. I literally, literally looked at this and like, this is the coach. This is the future of coaching, and this is going to be a huge advantage. I, I knew it. And I was like, well, how much is it? You know, it was like $35,000. And I was like 21 and 22. I was like, $35,000, like, you're your damn mind. I, I don't have $3,500 or maybe $35 a time. So fortunately, he was Russian. He was willing to negotiate. So I negotiated basically a payment system. And I was like, I'll make payments on this thing. I will spread the gospel of Omega Wave. Like, I will get out and sell this thing for you. And at the time, he's like, OK. Like, he basically gave me Randy's old system. And he gave me no training. So that was the caveat. He's like, you can have it, but I'm not going to teach you how to use it, basically. So I get this system. And I start using it, and I realized really quickly, like, I don't really know how to use this thing, but I have to learn and figure it out. So I had to learn the language. But instantly, I saw that this solved a very big need in fitness. And that was helping me understand what my workouts were actually doing to people and whether or not they were having the right effect. So the point would be every product and every idea should start with solving a problem. And that's what I saw when I looked at the Omega Wave. It solved a huge problem I had. I didn't know whether or not my workouts were right. I didn't know whether or not they were actually going to have the effect I wanted, and I didn't know why people always got results or didn't. I just guessed half the time, and sometimes I was right, sometimes I was wrong. So I started using the system, trained lots of combat athletes, started getting notoriety, um, and I think largely it was because of that. I was able to tap into this personalization. I was able to put together a better coaching product than most people because I had access to this information that other coaches simply didn't have. So 2009, I was on a forum. This is a long, depressing story I won't get too much into. But my mom had a stroke, and my business was kind of struggling because of that. And I'm on the couch at home one night, and I'm typing in SureDog, which who knows what SureDog is. Yeah, so it's an MMA forum, and at the time, MMA was really big. And I trained lots of pro fighters, lots of top-level guys, but I'd never written anything online. My website was just for my, my gym. And there's this forum about conditioning for MMA. And I'm like, oh, I wonder what people are talking about. And I look through it, and I'm like, this is just terrible garbage, basically. And so I make this post called How to Finally Solve Your Conditioning Program. And my message is basically like, stop doing the stupid shit on the site and start looking at your own conditioning this way. And it was, it was an abrasive message looking back on it, but it actually caused a shitstorm. Like, I got absolutely ripped apart. They're like, fuck you, noob. Like, who the hell are you, <laughs> right? <laughs> You don't know shit. And so I'm like, oh, I, I know shit. So I'm like, right, you know, like I'm just, I'm, I'm mad, with, you know, I'm going back at them basically. Like, oh, I, I didn't want to say who I had trained because that would have been a cop out. I just wanted to start like actually going down the rabbit hole of why they were wrong. And it just turned into this massive, like 400 thread discussion. And then finally, at some point, someone from the gym next door, AMC, chimed in. They were like, by the way, this guy's trained Rich Franklin and Chris Lieben and all these top pro fighters. And then everybody shut the hell up and, <laughs> and started asking questions. So I was like, this is amazing. Like, there, people want to know this information. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, it never occurred to me, for whatever reason, that I could take what I had done with those providers and turn that into a business, into a product. It was not my goal. I was just training those guys because I enjoyed training them and learning about that sport. So I'm like, well, I wonder if I could actually do something with this. So I was at lunch with this guy, George Grigel. He was Rich Franklin's buddy. And he was, he was like, you should make a website eight weeks out. And I was like, sounds good. Let's do that. So very little thought, but that's, people always ask me, what's AWS outcome from? I'm like, I don't know. It's just George's idea. And so then I basically go on the forum. like, hey, I've got AWS out online. Join the forum. And people started joining the forum. So I just literally started with a website with a forum. And so at some point, I was putting in a lot of time. I was up all night answering forum questions on my site. I was like, I've got to actually make money out of this because this is taking forever. So I thought, OK, I'm going to write a book. Ultimate MMA Conditioning came to mind. The problem was, I'm like, how many people are going to read a book about MMA conditioning? I don't really know. It seems like people are interested in this, but I've never written a public book like this. Like, let me see what happens. But I don't want to write the whole thing, and then it doesn't work out. So the famous story is I wrote half the book, and then I put it up for pre-sale. And then it took me way longer to finish it than I thought it was going to. But I had about 400 people sign up for it in 24 hours, which looking back was a really good launch, actually. So instantly, I was like, holy shit, people would really pay for this. You know, 400 people were willing to pay up front for a book I hadn't written yet or written half of. And that was really the start of, like, I can actually create something that's not a coaching, you know, not just in the gym, but I can create a product to help people do something and make them better. And people pay for that. And again, I wish I could say that was my path, my idea all along, but it, it really wasn't. It was just, again, once I got on SureDog, I was like, 
there's a need for this. People don't have this information, and they're willing to pay for it. And so I created that product. Same thing, 2011 was the evolution of, of basically my first experience with the MegaWave. And I recognized as mobile phones started coming out that we could take heart rate variability, we could make it more accessible so it wasn't $35,000, you didn't have to bribe Russians to, to get access to it. So I realized, let's create some sort of mobile app. But I didn't have a ton of money to create my own mobile app. And so I reached out to different people I saw online that were talking about HRV. I found a guy in the UK who'd created his own essentially HRV app using some hardware. And I said, can I make a version of your app with my own algorithms and change it, basically? And he's like, yeah, I'll do it. So I created a partnership with this guy named Simon over in the UK named, uh, called iFleet, it was, it was his app. I tweaked all the algorithms. I, built, I wrote a book that went with it, and I launched BioForce in 2011. And again, it was seeing a specific need that more people needed to have access to the technology I was using as a coach, and more people weren't going to spend the money or invest or, or negotiate deals, but they could do this on their phone. And at the time, you needed a little piece of a little hardware that plugged into the phone jack to read your chest strap. It was really primitive, but it actually worked really well. And so it grew. It was actually my first product launch ever where I did $100,000 in like one day. It was like, holy shit, like 100 grand in one day from, from online sales. Like it was mind boggling. But it was, again, it was an evolution in that journey of developing a product that solved the need that people had that they were willing to pay to solve. From there, I, did, I built a coach's version of it in 2014, and it did really well for quite a while. And then I started to unfortunately realize at that point that HRV had become much more popular, but that it also opened the door for much more competition. So I was selling it for like $170. People started giving it away for free. It became a commodity once Bluetooth 4.0 became possible. You didn't need that receiver. It was way easier to knock off, and anybody, everybody was making HRV up for free. So it was my fault that I didn't stay in tune with what was actually happening in the market. I just kind of figured my product was great. It would just keep going forever. And all of a sudden, I see the sales go right? So my sales literally didn't tank that bad. But they started going downhill pretty significantly. And I realized I needed to do something about it. And that's where this idea of Morpheus was born. So again, it was this, still it's just an evolution of an idea. And so I realized there were two big limitations uh, to, to BioForce. The first is. You know, if you just give somebody an HRV number, it's not always easy for them to understand what to do with it. There wasn't a great connection to the workout. And then the second thing was it didn't really tell you why HRV was changing. It just told you that it was. And the simplest explanation I told you, HRV gives you the cost of everything you've been doing to your body. It's a, it's a gauge of how much overall cost and stress you put your body under, but it doesn't tell you where that stress has come from. So the idea was I'd use Morpheus to solve that problem because I could take in wearable data, I could give activity and sleep and heart rates and how people felt. So I could connect all these dots for people. So I looked at it like, let's take all this data and let's connect the dots and let's solve the problems that I saw with Morpheus or with BioForce and let's create a new product. And that turned out to be a way bigger pain in the ass than I ever imagined, which I'll talk about as we actually build uh, the building process. But that led, leads us to the platform that most of you guys saw on Friday or Thursday, whenever that was which is the coaching app. Because the coaching app has always been the idea to take all this information and give it to coaches so they can use it in a powerful way and have the same sort of process of coaching people and delivering a better experience uh, the way that I did as a young coach, which I think was a huge part of my success. And what I also realized early on was, how many of you have seen coaches who just suck and yet they're really successful and have a lot of clients? Everybody's seen that asshole, right? <laughs> Everybody. You know, hopefully none of you are, but you, they're out there. And I used to be really angry when I was a young coach because I'd spent hours studying, reading super training, going to, you know, going to workshops all over the world and trying to build these kick-ass workouts and using technology. And then this dickhead is, is doing cardio fit and just smashing people and he's got clients out the door. Well, the, the thing I realized as I matured is his product and my products were not just the workout, it was the entire experience of training with him. And some people are just really entertaining to train with. They're very good at the coaching game, and the workouts might suck, but people love being around them. They have that magnetism, and that is their product, and that's great, but that's really hard to scale. That's really hard to be ever more than that guy coaching people. And so I realized I could give coaches a bigger tool to personalize their experience and deliver more than just a kick-ass workout, that we could actually connect the dots outside the gym. And ultimately, what I've realized as we progress through this is Morpheus is just a product to make coaches' products better. That's really what it is. It's to make your product as a coach, a gym owner, business owner, better, more effective, more personalized, more engaging, 
different than everybody else. That's what Morpheus is really all about. And then you know, at the end of the day, you're gonna deliver better results with it. So I'm gonna walk you through the process of building Morpheus and I'm gonna have Victor jump in to talk about how he is doing it and I'm gonna share my thoughts with how I would do it if I was him because I've been in his shoes and I am in his shoes in a lot of ways. So like I said, the first part of building a product, and again, this doesn't matter if you're talking about a training program, something in the gym, or you wanna go online, you wanna sell something, because that's something I get questions. I wanna sell something online. It's the same process, it doesn't really matter. It's the same concept. So you have to have an idea that solves a specific problem that people actually have and need solved. Then you have to do your homework and figure out, do you actually have a winner? And the answer is, this is where the guesswork comes in, but it's also the most important part of the whole process. Once you decide, like, I'm all in, and that's the biggest thing I'll say is, if you go in, don't half-ass it, go in. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I tried this thing, it didn't work. Did you actually try it, or did you just kind of try it? So build it, test it, bring it to life, and then launch it to the world and see what happens. And that's where the magic comes in. Sometimes it goes really well, and you're like, I'm a damn genius, and sometimes it bombs, and you have to figure out why. And I've had both of those, so I'll talk about that. So, First and foremost, who, who wants to South Park? South Park has great business principles, okay? Cartman is underappreciated. He's an idea man. He's got lots of good strategies. So if you haven't seen GoFundMe, it is one of the better South Park episodes of all time. Uh, and it's, it's a really good business lesson uh, episode. But again, we have to just understand that everything starts with the idea in your head. And we're having, we have these ideas all the time. You know, I had an idea that I wanted to build some sort of online coaching business, but only after I'd had a million other ideas that led me down that path. So ideas essentially add to themselves, and they evolve over time. But the first thing is figuring out, is your idea good? Because again, this is, I've had a million ideas I was convinced were genius that turned out to be really bad ideas. Like I looked through some of my, my domain names I bought and they were really stupid ideas, trust me. Domain names are terrible. But you have to first start with deciding, is your idea any good? So. There's a basic checklist, and I'll go through some more steps in this, but first and foremost, the biggest thing to start with is, does your idea solve a specific problem that people have? So in Victor's case, what, do you, what problem are you trying to solve for you with your platform? So there you go, that's a specific problem. So people in Latin America, they want to be taught from the best coaches, they want access, but because I don't speak Spanish, and most people do not, although I can speak a little Spanish, uh, that is a, the problem. They can't actually learn from these people without you bringing them down there, right? Yeah. And then would you say another problem is also that you run these courses live, but they're limited in how many people can come to them and they have to travel and all the other things, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's also like, you know, the uh, transportation barriers, it's not accessible for everyone. Exactly. So Victor's got a very clear goal of increasing accessibility and solving the problem of coaches in Latin America not being able to learn from the coaches that you're all able to learn from that speak English. So I would say check, like that's a problem that people really have and it solves it in that way. Secondly, has anyone else done it or tried to do it? So usually you would think like, well, if no one's done it, that makes it way better because I'm gonna be the first to market. Someone's probably thought of it before and if they, no one's ever done it, it might be because it's a stupid idea actually or because it's really hard or it's not gonna work. So it's easy to think that like you're the first to come up with this idea and you're a damn genius, but probably other people have come up with the idea in some form or fashion. So be skeptical if you've, you think that no one's ever thought of this before, because there's six billion people, somebody probably has. And I think through that. In Victor's case, it, look, I think it's an advantage if people have tried this before. People have obviously created websites and delivered courses, but are there any other course sites like that in Latin America? but you haven't looked yet, so we'll talk about that. So you don't know, right? There, you're missing part of the step here. Are you qualified to do this, or are you going to learn? Look, when I, when I first started getting into MMA conditioning, I didn't know shit about MMA. And the first big gym program that made real money for me was volleyball. I didn't play volleyball, but I was willing to learn. So you have to ask yourself, are you actually qualified to, to build? I'm not a software developer either, thank God but I've had to learn the software development business to build software. So you have to either be really qualified to build this product, or you have to be learning to will, willing to learn how to build a product and have the expertise, which I'm assuming you have been trained for long. And actually, so that's one more point I would say. A lot of people want to build online products because they think it's going to be easier or more scalable before they've built a gym that's successful at all. If you've never built a successful gym product that you can coach, it's going to be way harder for you 
to then expand that into the online world. It's not like this magic button where you push it online that's more successful. So Victor was just telling me yesterday, he's moving, he lives on the beach six hours away from his gym. He doesn't have to run his gym in person anymore, and your gym makes you enough money to live on the beach, I'm assuming, right? Yeah. So obviously he's built a successful enough gym that he can not have to be working there 24 hours a day and it's still successful. In fact, he can hang out on the beach and work on other products, which is what we should try to get to. If I'm Victor, I'm living the dream right now. So if you can ask yourself that question, ha have I done this in person? Do I have the knowledge? And can I therefore transfer that knowledge into a product? If the answer is yes, you probably have a good idea. And then last but not least is being really realistic as much as you can about how much money and how much time this is going to take, because both of those are the biggest limiting factors in everybody's world. Time and money, that's your two greatest resources and your two biggest limitations. And I remember having a conversation with John Berardi years and years ago, um, we were on something, some board together, and he was talking about Precision Nutrition had so many opportunities, like so many things being thrown at them, so many partnerships, so many people wanting to do money with them, they didn't even have time to like evaluate them all. They, they didn't have the staffing to like go through and evaluate whether or not these ideas had to merit or could help PN grow. So even you know, companies with millions of dollars, he told me a story, Apple kind of had the same discussion with them. Like Apple didn't have time to evaluate all these things. So you're limited in how much money and time you have, so you have to be very judicious and intelligent and deliberate about where you spend them. So you can't go half-cocked on every idea you have because it's going to lead to lots of half-cocked half products and not lots of success. So you'd be really, really honest about what it's going to take in terms of time and money. So from there, let's say you meet those criteria. The next step is the pitch, okay? And how many of you watched Shark Tank before? Everybody watched Shark Tank. Shark Tank is really valuable, I think, because you see different people have different opinions. And these are professional investors who've made millions, or in you know, Cuban's case, a billion plus dollars with picking the right winning products and the right winning companies. And they all have different ideas about what's going to be successful. So it's never a clear cut, this is gonna work, this is not gonna work. They get it wrong. You know, they don't invest in stuff that goes crazy and then they miss stuff, or they invest in stuff that just bombs. So it's really good though just to get different opinions. So I have this thing I call the idea funnel. So first of all, I don't tell anybody because it's probably a bad idea first. So I sit on it. I come up with a genius idea, I tell my wife, that's it. And she is honest with me, but sit on it. Don't just rush out and tell everybody about it. Think about it. Give yourself a day or two. Decide, is this actually something that makes sense, or am I just being a little overenthusiastic? Pitch it to peers. Okay, Luca's my, kind of my first, one of my first peers, and Luca's enthusiastic about everything. But I can tell, based on his level of enthusiasm, whether or not it's actually a good idea or not. But reach out to other people that you coach. Reach out to other gym owners, other business people in this room. And there's a lot of people in this room that have been extremely successful, far more successful than I have in lots of ways. And, Reach out to them, talk to them, see what they think, pitch to them, what do you think about this? And again, it's really good to get honest responses from people because it helps you gauge whether or not your ideas are right. And again, start with the assumption that you probably don't have it figured out, and hopefully if you go through this process, you realize maybe I actually do. Okay, pitch it to potential customers. That's where, again, if you have people in the gym that you think would be the perfect fit for this program, or you have people online or whatever, start pitching it. Say, hey, I'm thinking about this thing, what do you think? You know, you, you see people throw stuff on social media, I'm gonna think about building this, who would be interested? Start pitching it to people who think would actually buy it, engage their response. And this is where if you really wanna get technically savvy, you can run paid traffic and you can use social media to pitch it to different audiences, you can try headlines, you can do all kinds of shit to dial us in, but go through this process of pitching to people you think would be willing to buy it. Are they interested? Do they get excited about it? Do they ask questions? If they ask questions, that's actually a really good sign because it means they're considering it. If they're like, yeah, it's awesome. That's not as good, actually, as, oh, yeah, but, but how does this work? How's it, what's it going to cost? I mean, you want people engaged with that. From there, if you have to raise money, this is your final straw. And you want to have gone through this process before you get to an investor, I promise you, because they're going to ask a lot tougher questions than your potential customers are, and you need to know the answers. And in Morpheus's case, I've had to raise money three or four times separately, and it's not my favorite thing, but every time you actually learn from it, because the questions they ask are probably questions you need to have the answers to if it's gonna be successful. If you can't answer those questions and they don't give you their money, they, maybe they were smarter than you, maybe they, they weren't gonna lose it because you didn't have the answers to questions that you should have. And then from there, pitch it to the world. So that's where your launching is gonna come from, that's where all these things are gonna take place. But go down this funnel before you ultimately make the decision to go deep, to go all in, to go out. And then even after that, 
there are no guarantees in the world. So these are all like products and logos that come up with over the years. Some of them have been wildly successful and some of them bombed. And, and to go back to this idea, so I wrote Ultimate Enemy Conditioning and it did really well. After I launched it, I was selling thousands of copies. Like it was doing extremely well. And I was getting emails from people saying, hey, I've used your book to train you know, football players. I've used your book to train hockey players. And I've used your book to train uh, you know, swimmers and just kind of all range of sports that had nothing to do with MMA because the book was about energy systems, which is universal. So I'm like, this is great. I'm a genius. OK, what am I going to do next? OK, well, books are hard to read for a lot of people. They don't want to deal with it. Uh, and MMA seems kind of limiting because people are using it for other sports. So a DVD, yeah, that's going to do really, really well, right? I'm going to do a DVD, and I'm going to make it all you know, video-based exercises and methods and lecture, and I'm going to make it less narrow. So it's going to be called the Conditioning Blueprint. That's going to work really well. I mean, it's a great follow-up to Ultimate Conditioning. It's, it's broader, more people. It's video, so they don't have to read. It bombed. Like, I think like 120 sales compared to like, what's that? Thank you. That's right. See, Luke is enthusiastic. He'll buy anything. So he's not a good test. Uh, but it was good. It was a very good learning experience that, and again, this is like my second big launch. And I'm, I'm super amped. And Old Maid Condition, I wrote myself for free. And my cousin edited it. And my cousin's half illiterate. So if, you, if you've read the book, there's some typos. That's, that's his fault. Uh, but you know, I invested a lot of money and time into this one. Like I had, I had to have a video guy, and he came out and did the editing. And we did like motion graphics, and I had to get the packaging designed. I had to find someone to print the thing. I had to buy. I bought a thousand DVDs. That was, you know, my my optimism, thinking like, oh, well, my conditioning book was successful. Of course, this DVD is going to be successful, and it bombed. It didn't. It didn't work. And there was lots of reasons for it. I think number one, people don't actually like to watch DVDs back then. Uh, and number two, people wanted a more specific thing. Like MMA conditioning was specific. The conditioning blueprint was rather vague. So there's multiple reasons why it didn't do as well as I thought. But it was a really big eye opener. And I actually went back afterwards, and I asked the people who didn't buy, why didn't you buy it? Because that's also really valuable. And that was a lot of the reasons I got. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know what they were going to get. Like they didn't want to watch a DVD. There was a bunch of stuff. So it's, it's really valuable to learn from both your wins and your failures. Because again, you can go through this whole process of Pitching to everybody and you get good feedback, but that's not a guarantee for success, unfortunately. So once you do make the decision to build it, I can tell you in my experience, the first thing is start with the right team. And with Morpheus's case, there's a powerful lesson I learned. There, was, there were two guys that came into the gym, and I needed two things. I needed money to build Morpheus, and I needed a team to build Morpheus. And I thought I had nailed it both with these guys that came in the gym. One of them was a guy who has masters from MIT in machine learning. Uh, he worked at Amazon for a number of years, and he played collegiate football at MIT. Like, on paper, like, this guy is genius. Like, he's the perfect engineer to help me build this thing. His brother was a high-level Olympic weightlifter, and they were, quote, unquote, investors. Their family had invested in lots of projects and different things. They, they had some capital. So essentially, I convinced both of them to come join Morpheus and, at the same time, invest their own money into Morpheus. So I'm like, this team is great. Like, look at the, you know, I've got this guy from MIT. He's got a master's. He came from Amazon. He's, he's putting his money in. He's, this guy's going to be perfect. Like, we've got the best team ever. Turned out they didn't want to work for shit. Like, they were not entrepreneurs, neither one of them. They would never worked to start before. They'd worked for other big corporations. They didn't want to actually do the work. They just wanted to say they did the work, unfortunately. Turned out to be a, a goddamn nightmare. It took me like a year to get rid of them, and it cost me a bunch of money to get rid of them. So the lesson was really simple. Like, I didn't vet them very well. I was so enthusiastic about it. I looked at their credentials on paper. But it doesn't always work out that way. So, and, and I'll tell you my experience. People that have worked in corporate type settings are the worst to bring into startup type settings, because they just aren't cut out for it. They probably would have started something themselves if they were. That's not always the case. But I've had much more success with people that have entrepreneurial mindsets than with people who grew up and worked in the corporate world. So, Use your network. You know, in that case, that didn't work out for me. But in general, the more my network has grown, the more I can ask people, have you worked with this person? What do you think about this person? I've also gone to do a trial run with people. You know, if you're a pilot and you get hired by the airlines, you're on probation for a year. They can can your ass for a year, and you get paid very little to be a pilot. And it's smart, actually. Like, you should have an introductory period. So these days, before I hire anybody new, I do test projects. Like, if I'm looking for somebody for like an online, say I go to Upwork, and I want to find a video editor, for example, I'll just do a really simple video editing product, project that might cost 100 bucks, and I'll see what their work is before I would ever hire them for something bigger. So that's the one thing I've, I've learned these days is test. The, 
the people you're going to work with or hire before you hire them or give them a lot of responsibility. And I've learned more often than not, like, they can say everything perfect in an interview, and they can look like the perfect candidate on paper, and they look like they should be the best thing for your team, but until you start working with them, you have no idea. You're just, you're just making educated guesses again. And more, I've been more wrong than I've been right in those ones, unfortunately. Build a prototype if you can. You know, sometimes that's more feasible than others. But you want to get something out there to get actual feedback from real life people. So have you, like Victor actually is a good example of this. So you did live courses, obviously, right? So he built a bunch of live, brought live courses. I did one. And how many speakers have you brought to those courses out of curiosity? So he, he's, got a pro, he's got a pro type in the sense that he knows people will pay for education in Latin America. Have you done any online yet? Uh, myself? Yeah, have you, no, so you haven't done one yet. So an easy one for him to do, like let's say he doesn't want to bring someone in to film a whole new course. Did you film the ones you've done so far? Yes. Okay, so if Victor wants to prototype this thing without bringing in a new speaker and filming the whole thing, he's got pre-recorded courses he could try out and see if people are as likely to pay for courses online in Latin America as they are to coming to a live event. That's always the question is, is it the experience people are paying for to be in front of an audience like this and you know, go back and forth, or are they just paying for the education? What are they actually paying for? And that's something you have to find out by finding out, will people pay for an online course in Costa Rica? And if so, how much will they pay? So you've already got the people that you've shot, you've recorded stuff for you, he could try selling that. He could try selling one course. If he gets a good response, that's probably an indication that building more of these and doing it more, more uh, in a bigger format will work. If it bombs, the question is why? Does he really want to go all the way down that path? So if you can test this, test it. You know, in the case of Morpheus, you know, we had Bioforce. I knew that the app and the whole thing could be successful, but I knew we had to get to a point where we could add in all these new features, new devices, and it took a lot of testing. It was a real big pain in the ass. And then, you know, get that feedback as you build it, and then, like I said, always assume it costs more time and more money and more headache than you plan for, and then plan that it's gonna take even more than you think it's gonna take on top of how much you think it's gonna take. So it's taken us two years, basically, to get to the coaching platform to where we actually have this thing which we're launching on Tuesday. Two years of work, some of that was COVID, uh, and about $2 million, and I never expected it was gonna take that much money to build this thing. I'm like, oh, we're gonna get it done in six or nine, you know, six to nine months with our projections. So I was off by like half, more than half. I was way off, even though I'd assumed it would take longer. But some of that was COVID, and some of that was Gold Gym, which we'll talk about at some point. So when it comes to building a product, you have to realize your customers are who you're building it for. And I've made the mistake of building something I thought would be awesome because I would want it, but I didn't stop to think, would my customers actually want it? So this was actually the first, this DVD actually did pretty well, but this was my first product that wasn't really coaching. And so I had done this this workshop for, for volleyball athletes in my gym on the idea, again, that I could get volleyball players to come in and learn how to train, and it turned out to be correct. I built this massive volleyball program in the gym because volleyball players at that point had no one offering specific volleyball training, and volleyball parents are absolutely crazy that will spend a huge amount of money on their, their athletes, their daughters, because they want them to be successful. So I built this big product, and I had a bunch of girls coming in, and I thought, there's, and then I went to the tournaments, uh, to, to watch the girls train. And these tournaments are, at least pre-COVID days, were like 10 to 20,000 girls and parents. Like it was just insane how big these tournaments were. And I thought if we had educational tools like a DVD and a book, we could, I could sell this to girls at tournaments and I could get more people coming in and support them. And so I did, I built this. But I realized I had only been running these volleyball programs for a little while. I didn't know a whole lot about volleyball players. And so I started really digging in, I spent about, three, four months just digging in and asking myself, who were these people buying the book? Was it the parents? Was it the athletes? Like, who was actually buying it? You know, what were the biggest problems that volleyball players had? I started doing a lot more testing, looking at results. And then what would make, ultimately what I found out was the parents were buying this. It was not the volleyball players. They were like 14. The last thing they were spending their allowance on was a book about volleyball. So I figured out basically what was the parents' emotional triggers? What made the parents want to spend money on this? And that was to get their athletes to get their daughters playing better, obviously jumping higher, hitting harder, staying healthier, and getting to college. And so when I built the book, I was really diving into these things. And the book, it was a book DVD combo, actually. Um, and it did really well, and large, largely because, again, I dove into the research. This is basically uh, you know, the way you should do it. The way I did with, with Ultimate the Conditioning Blueprint was I assumed it was just going to work because the last one had. But this one, 
uh, you know, I actually dove into the numbers and dove into the people and did a lot more homework, and it was successful as a result. So I kind of give you the short back, like I said, it's taken about two years to get here. So we launched it originally in 20, the first actual consumer app in 2017, 18 or so, a little bit later than that. And then the idea had always been to get the consumer version working well enough, we could take all the data and give it to coaches and, and build what we showed you on whenever the day that was, Friday, I think, Thursday, Thursday. But it, I realized that in order to do that, it would cost a lot more money and take a lot more time. And so I was literally in the process of going back to the process, pitching to investors, getting people to fund it. I knew I had to build my team out. I knew that we'd have to give a lot more work, a lot more time into the coach's app because we were taking data from people's phones all over the place, putting it into the app, building life heart rate training, it has to connect with devices. Like It's just a complicated bunch of shit going on behind the scenes to make it happen, honestly. And right around the time I was going through this process, um, I happened to get a call from somebody who was working at Gold's Gym. And his name was Tori Hale. Tori was here last year. So Tori had heard me on a call with someone at Onnit, and they, were, they actually just were asking questions about HRV and recovery. And so I was just on this call with Onnit, and Tori happened to work there at the time. Tori then got brought back to Gold's. He worked there previously to help develop this new project. And Gold's was essentially looking at the market, and they're saying too many people are leaving Gold's to go to F45 or Orange Theory or Barry's Boot Camp or SoulCycle or whatever. And so they wanted to do figure out a solution to this, and their idea was to start a small boutique gym to compete with them called Element 79. Does anyone know why Element 79 would be their name? Exactly, me either. So Element 79 is gold on the periodic table. That was their idea. I'm like, if it's that hard to figure out, is that really the best idea? Uh, but they wanted to build this concept to compete with these gyms, and they wanted to do it using exactly what we were trying to build with Morpheus. So I met with the CEO, I pitched him, you know, I pitched their team, and then in my experience working with big companies, usually it's a pain in the ass, it takes months to get an answer. These guys were like signing the dotted line like two weeks after I met with the CEO. Like they were, they were all in very, very soon. And their idea was basically pay us to develop exactly what we were already developing, but give them a version that was very specific and integrated to what they wanted to do. So what they only wanted to do was have different levels of classes throughout the day, easier, lower level recovery classes, which they call lit classes, moderate intensity class, which they call mid classes, and high intensity, you know, kick your ass class, they call uh, hit classes. And Morpheus was gonna track recovery, it was gonna deliver the heart rate, the intervals like I showed you, and it was gonna make recommendations. And it would help you build your schedule based on your progression and your recovery and your own fitness. So their idea was basically to create this personalized experience within a boutique gym, and they were gonna use that to differentiate themselves. And so, awesome, like I've got the deal of my life. Like if these guys build, this company and they are successful with it, I'm gonna just sell my ass out to them and retire because the company that owned them had a billion dollars and that company would have much rather just bought Morpheus than to keep paying us what they would have had to keep paying us if it was really successful. So everything looks great. Like I spend tons of money, I build my team from like five or six up to like 15. Like we're going full steam ahead to build this thing. We are kicking ass, we get new office space, all this stuff is great. And then COVID hits. And so what does Gold's do? They close their gym doors and they stop paying me money. Then Gold tells me, well, keep building it. We're going to open our gym doors you know, once things you know, get back to normal and we'll, and we'll pay you. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So at one point, Gold's owed me a whole lot of money, which I didn't have to pay people that I owed money to. So it was you know, a trying time. I had, to, I had to get rid of some people. We were fortunately able to get rid of the office space. We got some money from the government and just kind of worked our way through it. So essentially that's been the last you know, year is having to go a lot slower than we had planned because unfortunately the company that bought Gold's uh, when they went through bankruptcy decided they were just gonna go back to bodybuilding. Their idea was Gold's isn't successful because it's strayed too far from its roots and we're gonna go back to hardcore bodybuilding powerlifting. We're gonna get rid of anything to do with group fitness. We're gonna focus on powerlifters and bodybuilders and like we're gonna build a Gold's brand. We don't wanna build a new brand. And so they just kind of swept it clean. So, the moral story is shit happens, you just never know, and you have to keep going. I had choices. I could have folded it at that point, or I could figure out a way. And so I said, let's, we're, we're, I'm all in. Like, we've spent this much money, we've spent this much time, let's keep going. So I was able to raise some money from a few people, I was able to get to a point where we could show success with it in our beta testing, and we're, like I said, we're four days away now from actually launching this thing and getting it out there, so it's really exciting. But there's, oh, thank you. But again, there are no guarantees, right? So I'll talk about the process. So once you have a kick-ass product, 
you have an idea, you've built it, you've tested it, now it's time to actually launch it. And I realized going through this presentation, I've launched a lot of shit over the years, a lot of products. And again, some have done really well, some have not done really well, but for the most part, you know, they have. There's definitely some failures. But the formula that I followed is, is really pretty straightforward, and it, it works. So the first thing is you have to have an announcement. So once you build this thing, and I would not recommend announcing it before you built it like I did with the book, but build the book, build, sorry, build the product, get some feedback, because that's going to be really valuable for you when you make the announcement, and then let the, neuro, let the world know why it's coming, or what's coming, and why, why it's so important. Step two is basically educate your list, uh, excite them, and build a specific list of people who are the most interested in. That's the model that everyone does, whether you're Apple, whether you're Precision Nutrition, whether you're me. Anytime you launch something new, you want to build a list, get a notification, get an early bird, whatever it's called. You want to get people that are the most interested on a list so you can focus on them and get them excited about it. And then three is open the doors. Make it really easy, make it really accessible, have some sort of scarcity, get them excited about the offer. And so I'll walk through each of these three steps to finish off. But this is ultimately what you want to do once you get to the point you have something. So when, when Victor is ready to launch this platform, this is what he's going to do. And I was talking about ways to do this. So first and foremost, you need a landing page. And I've seen a lot of uh, examples of landing pages that suck. But it's not really that hard in this day and age with so many tools out there to build a good landing page. So first and foremost, you need a good benefit-driven headline. It needs to talk about what the problem you're solving is. You need the detail, like when does this thing launch, when is it open, what are they going to get, all that sort of stuff. Some sort of urgency and scarcity, like we only have 200 spots that we can sell basically to Morpheus coaches, and that's not made up. That's because we only have a set number of devices. And if we sold up 500 coaches, I'd be out of devices in a week, unfortunately. So that's our limiting factor. What they'll get, why you, they should trust you, some social proof on there, and some FAQ, like why should you be interested in this product. So this is the landing page that I've used with my certification course, which it does extremely well for us. You look at Precision Nutrition's, like there's a lot of commonalities you see in landing pages. But if you're going to launch something, you need something to actually drive people to. You need more than just a social media post. You need a social media post going to something people can learn more about it and signing up for something to get more information. You want to build that list above all else, because those are the people that are going to be extremely interested in your product. So with Morpheus, this is what we have. And if you go to trainmorpheus.com slash morpheus-coaching-platform, which is not the best URL, I admit, but we are mostly sending our existing customers there because we don't have that much capacity to sell. But this is basically what we have. We've got a big headline. We've got the details. Request invite. The page goes down more to it. But we've got about 1,500 people, 1,500 coaches, essentially, on this list right now. So if I know I'm trying to sell a couple hundred, I can estimate how many people I need in that list to make this work. So have a landing page. So if you suck at landing pages, use something like Unbounce. Go to Upwork and have people make landing pages for you. There's, there's millions of ways to get landing pages made for fairly inexpensively and fairly easily, but you need something. So if you're going to post on social media, you need somewhere to send them. And for Victor, this is the first thing he would do, is make a page that says, hey, I've got this course coming with Joel Jameson in Spanish, it's going to be awesome, check it out, it's coming soon, sign up for it. And this would actually be one way he could test it. If a bunch of people sign up for the insiders list, then he could have me do the course. If they don't, maybe he realizes it's not a great idea, or the course title's wrong, or who knows. So guerrilla marketing, just telling people you know about it. Simplest way to start, it doesn't cost anything. Partners, okay, Luca, again, great partner. Luca's always the man. If Luca wants, if I want something, Send out to Luca's network, Luca will send it. Guys like Mike Robertson, a bunch of people I've worked with over the years, they will post stuff, they will share stuff. You have people in your network who will help spread the word, and that's what you want them doing. Don't just say, hey, tell your audience about this. It's, hey, send them here. They need to go here because you want this list. This is your goal. This list of people is ultimately who is going to buy. If people won't take two seconds to opt in by giving you their email, they're probably not that likely to buy. I'm not saying they won't, but they're a lot less likely to buy than the people who sign up. So you want to build this group of ravaging people that can't wait to get Morpheus or whatever it is you're selling. Again, social media here. I was talking to Victor about this last night. How many of you feel really good about driving lots of traffic with paid traffic? That you love paid traffic and spending lots of money on Facebook? Nobody, right? But the reality is paid tra there's two ways to be really successful in social media. One way is to have a great personality and to be online all the time and follow all the stuff that other people here have talked about to build their personalities and build their social media followings. That's not me personally. I'm not great at that. It's not what I enjoy doing as much. The second way is you can pay for it. 
All right, we spend half a million dollars plus on Facebook because I don't have to then shoot a bunch of videos all day. It's just not, not me. So you can pay for it or you can invest your own time into creating videos, content. You can do both, obviously, is probably the best way to do it. But if you don't know how to promote and you don't want to use Facebook and get into Ads Manager, which is complicated as hell, you literally just create a business account for social media for either Facebook or Instagram. You say, I want a business account. And you can turn your personal account into a business account. And then you can promote your own posts, which means you're just paying for more people to view them. And that's why I was telling Victor, like, he doesn't have to go crazy on social media spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, but if you put a post out there about your event and it gets some good traction, promote it. You just hit promote, it's one button, and you tell Facebook, show this to more people, and I want to spend this amount of money. And Facebook will take it and it'll show it to more people in your audience and more people outside of your audience that look like your audience, and you can get very good results and very good feedback and very good uh, ROI on just a very, very simple promote post. You don't have to dig into Ads Manager, which is a pain in the ass, and you don't have to go all the way down this rabbit hole of social media marketing if you don't want to. You can just really start by putting a post up, it gets good traction, and promote it. 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 200 bucks. And you will get people that will take that action. It's not scalable. If you want to go from 100 people signing up to 10,000 people signing up, you have to go way deeper in the rabbit hole. But to just get traction and get additional viewers and eyeballs, you can just promote the posts on Facebook or Instagram or both. And Facebook will just say, oh, how much do you want to spend? And you tell them, and then boom, you can do it. It's, it's a really valuable way if you're not going to, if you don't have a huge following, which is what I hear people say, don't have 100,000 followers, neither do I. I have like 27,000 or something. But I spend enough money that I get to an, enough eyeballs, it doesn't matter. So that's a really easy way to start. And that's what I was telling Victor. Just promote your posts. If you get a post that kicks ass, spend 100 bucks on it and see how many people sign up for your list. That's the measure. So, and Facebook will convert that, will tell you basically how many people signed up how many people took the action, and that's what you want. So email, of course, is the last one. I've got the email list, but how have I built the email list? I built the email list by driving people to free courses, to master classes, to my certification, to articles. You know, I'm spending money to drive people to very specific places. So my biggest advice is when you are making your social media posts, have a purpose towards building an email list, building an invite list. Make it more than just showing them what you've got. There's value in that, but I tend to always try to have a specific purpose why we are getting people to do something in Facebook. And for us, it's been the most successful is just content around a training method or content around a course, specific content that coaches find valuable with a call to learn more here. And that's honestly what 90% of what we do is. Now, once you've started this process, there's a build-up phase where you're trying to educate, inform, and excite. You're just trying to reinforce to the people that are interested why they have this problem and how you're going to help them solve it. So this is my content calendar for the month of September. What I've done is I created a course called Train, Recover, Repeat, and that was to, again, do exactly what I said, inform, educate, and excite, show them how to do different intervals, show them why recovery is so important, show them how to take the recovery and turn it into better workouts. I use articles for that, video for the pod, you know, I've done Mike Robertson's podcast, I've been on a million podcasts lately, we've been posting on social media, using my email, all of it. Like, this is what you want leading up to your product launch because you want the people that are most excited to be the ones who are in line and to understand why they have this problem that your product is going to solve for them. So don't be afraid to just get out there. If you're going to launch something, go all in. And it, doesn't, it shouldn't be like 10 weeks. You'll lose momentum. Two to three weeks is really all about all you want, maybe four. But if you start going eight weeks out, 10 weeks out, it's too far away. You want to really build that momentum and be really active. You also don't want to burn people out by talking about this forever before it gets there. So like I said, two to three weeks of article content, podcasts, social media videos, email, and you just want to get it in front of people with a million different reasons why your product is awesome and why and how it's going to help them fix their problem. So, and again, you are going largely to the people who have joined your insiders <coughs> list and joined your notification list, and you're also going to the broader audience to get them on that list, period. That is your goal. So once you open the doors, this is where the fun happens. Okay, if you've ever launched a product, you know this is like the scariest point before you like, you know, hit send to that final email with a link to sign up. The next day, you wake up and you hope you see this, your, you know, your inbox flooded with sales, and you hope to not see the exact opposite, which I've had both. And it sucks to put months into something or a lot of money and time into something and have it just not work the way you want to. But usually when that happens, there's a very specific reason for it, and you can learn from that, and you can re- think what you did in that process that you could have maybe done better. But again, this is where all the stuff that you've done leading up to that point pays off. You get people signed up for it. Again, this could, this could be as simple as 
you want to offer a new class in the gym that specifically targets this group of people, maybe you want to launch a new course or a new program that incorporates Morpheus, it, it doesn't have to be this huge elaborate six month process. It could be something that takes you a few weeks to build and you launch it. But if you start to look at, again, your coaching and your gym as a product and a series of products, rather than just workouts, you should be always creating these types of things to keep your gyms and keep your coaching evolving and getting better. Don't let yourself be successful and get stuck there because sooner or later, you will lose it. And then finally, hopefully it does well, build success stories. You know, these are things that people just, they just go on Instagram, they message me this shit. I don't even have to do anything. I mean, we do ask for testimonials. So that's one piece of advice I'll say is when people buy, we send them an email that Judy says, hey, we're really excited to have you sign up. It's awesome, can't wait to get you involved. Let us know what was the biggest reason you decided to join us. And we use that as feedback to figure out you know, why did people buy? Was it because of what we thought? Or sometimes it's because of things you didn't even think about. Maybe you didn't quite even understand your market, but they were, there was still a reason there, even if it was slightly different than what you thought it was. And that's been really powerful for us to learn, as then we can kind of go back into our sales copy and back into our product, and we can tweak the language based on what we learned from the people that bought. Because the people that bought, bought for a reason. And then, like I said, I often will go after a launch, and I'll send people a really short survey, three questions. Hey, like, if you answer these three questions for me, I'm going to pick one person to get the product anyway. I mean, it's not super incentivizing because they didn't buy it, but they will, you'll get really good feedback from people that didn't buy. And sometimes you'll get answers that don't really help you because they're just all over the map. And sometimes they'll be like, oh, shit, I didn't realize. It was just this one thing that kept most people from buying. And a lot of times it's, I didn't understand what I was getting, which you're like, what do you mean you didn't understand what you're getting? It was all, it, but people don't look at it the same way you look at it. So it's really valuable to launch something and find out why did you buy if you bought, and why didn't you buy if you didn't buy, and use that information to just improve this process over time. And again, that's what it comes down to. Is this, where we're at now is 20 years of launching products and learning along the way and thinking through, how can I make this better? How can I make my coaching business better? How can I help other coaches make their coaching businesses better? And ultimately, you just progress down that point to where you start with you know, writing a book at 2 AM and having your illiterate cousin edit it to spending $2 million you know, on a, on a platform to help coaches, I think, and transform the way people coach. So, hope it helps. I don't know if I need to spend any time in Q&A here because we're gonna be doing Q&A next, but there's supposed to be another slide. Which doesn't look like, oh, nope. I don't know what happened there. But uh, I've got 54 seconds left for questions. Or maybe just do, do it on the uh, panel. What do you think? Oh, there you go, perfect. There's the last one. So, start up, cash in, sell out, and bro down. That's my plan, so. <laughs> And if we have any questions, should we take them now or you want to wait till the panel? Uh, what? All right, sounds good. Okay. I was feeling that. How are you guys feeling? We got one last, one last thing, Q&A. Um, Kenny and Andrew were nice enough to bring everyone donuts. So after Q&A, these guys brought everybody donuts. So we'll make